it, the outcome was unsuccessful, then you eliminate that first move. And so over time, if you just choose alternatives at random, you begin to eliminate alternatives. So that at the end, come in, have a seat, uh, you have a situation in which the chess plane program, the checkers plane program, always wins because it never repeats a branch that led to a failure. So you, you have a, a fairly simple device, a fairly simple definition of learning. And I'll come back to this notion of learning uh, in a moment. But at a conference at Dartmouth University in 1956, the cyberneticians and the artificial intelligence people parted company. This is sort of the history of cybernetics. Uh, and the issue that led to the split was how to create an artificial intelligence device. There were basically two strategies. One is you could tell the machine how to do the task, to say, do this. Or you could let it learn like this. In other words, the machine interacts with the environment, stumbles around, makes all kinds of mistakes. Eventually, it programs itself uh, in a sequence of activities that works. But that takes time. It's sort of like a teenager. You know, They make lots of mistakes before they finally get it right. Well, if you're sending a robot up to Mars, do you want it to stumble around for X numbers of years before it learns how to do what it wants? what you want it to do? Most likely not. You'd like it to work right the first time. So you program, say, do this, 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 and this, and this. OK, so the engineers took the path of programming, and the cyberneticians stuck with the path of learning and cognition and trying to understand how the brain worked. And it was in the late 1950s, right around 1960, that Heinz von Forster established the Biological Computer Laboratory at the University of Illinois. Let me say a little bit about Heinz. I studied with him at Illinois. Uh, he came from Austria. Uh, his family was partly Jewish. But he survived the war uh, by going to Berlin, <laughs> if you can believe that, where people didn't know his family history. Uh, and so after the war, uh, he went back to Vienna and was working on a variety of tasks. Uh, he always worked on something in physics. Uh, during the war, he was doing pure research on plasmas or something like that. Um, but he wrote an article on the mechanism of memory. And his interest was, how does memory work? Remember, this is the mid-1940s. Uh, you could have a reverberatory loop uh, in your network of neurons. Uh, or it could be at the atomic level, or it could be at the molecular level. And simply by doing an energy analysis, he said that uh, if it's at the atomic level, um, the temperature, normal temperature, would wipe out the traces. Uh, if it's at a reverberatory loop level, you couldn't retain enough information in order to get through the day because it would be too energy intensive. So it had to be at the molecular level by process of elimination. So he did an article from a physical science point of view on where memory needed to be located. And it turned out he was right. It was at the molecular level of the synapse. But that article got him invited to the Macy Foundation conferences because McCulloch saw the article. But his English was terrible. <laughs> so they made him the editor of the proceedings. So to, that forced him to practice his, his English. So he edited the proceedings, and Margaret Mead looked over his shoulder, in a sense, and checked it. So that's how he learned English, by doing the proceedings in the Macy conferences. But then he went back during the late 50s and 60s to doing standard electrical engineering research. Uh, the late 50s, until he got a sabbatical. And then on his sabbatical, he went to study with Arturo Rosenbluth, who also worked with Wiener. And that got him excited about cybernetics. So he set up the Biological Computer Laboratory. Uh, 
Now, Heinz is a, a remarkable individual. He, uh, he started skiing in the days when you had to climb the mountain in order to ski down it. And there are some films of him in the early skiing days. This was like in the 20s and 30s. Uh, he had a, an ebullient personality. He was just very friendly and just sort of seemed to bounce around and, and a very engaging personality. Uh, definitely an extrovert. And he would get together people who had some sort of an interest in his concept of the observer. He had this notion that science should include the observer. Uh, and his mother, let me see now, his mother was an artist and his grandmother, his mother's mother, was one of the leaders of the women's rights movement in Austria around the turn of the century. But his mother was involved in the artistic community, and so whenever she would take him around to wherever it was when he was a child, he grew up with the artistic uh, community in uh, Vienna. And so Heinz was always surrounded by artworks of some sort. He did some early work in electronic music. Uh, some of his friends were in the music department. Um, so art and that kind of analogical reasoning that helps you see connections uh, was very much a part of Heinz's approach to things. Uh, whenever he would do a reprint, he would have some image on the front that supposedly had some connection to the content of the article. I couldn't often see the connection, but nevertheless, they were, they were very attractive reprints. But this, this outgoing and engaging personality, along with his highly interdisciplinary interests, had a tendency to create this um, unusual mix of people associated with the Biological Computer Laboratory at the University of Illinois. And it was during this time that the Pentagon was quite interested in this field. Uh, remember, they were interested in mind control experiments. Obviously, they were interested in computer technology. So there was money available from the Office of Naval Research, the Office, uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research. So Heinz was a fairly successful academic entrepreneur in terms of getting money flowing through the Biological Computer Laboratory. Um, I'll come back to that later. Now, let's go back to this split between cybernetics and artificial intelligence, the difference between programming and learning. The way learning was described in the late 50s was by using the term self-organization. So the notion was that you had self-organizing systems. So that you had an organism that interacted with its environment and somehow the organism organized itself. That was the early conception. At one of these conferences, there were three of them held around 1960, Heinz wrote an article called um, Self-Organizing Systems and Their Environments. And, with, and in that article, he says there's no such thing as a self-organizing system because if it's organized by its environment, then it's not organized by itself. So you have a logical uh, incompatibility. Uh, that was later resolved by taking the organism and the environment together and calling that the self-organizing system. Uh, but I'll get to that in a little bit, a little bit later. So there were these kind of, uh, there were, the, the field has a tendency to change the language that it uses. Like there were a series of conferences on bionics. Then there were a series of conferences on self-organizing systems. Uh, nowadays, the N word is complexity or complex adaptive systems. Uh, you can think of it as an, an ongoing stream, but somehow the language tends to change. And the work on complexity is, in my view, an outgrowth of this work on self-organizing systems. In any case, uh, in the early 1960s, there was a perception of a cybernetics gap between the United States and the USSR. Now remember, this was the Cold War, okay? Nuclear weapons on both sides, people were very tense. And cybernetics had become a really big thing in the Soviet Union. The reason was the Soviets saw cybernetics as the science that would help them operate their centrally planned economy. 
In fact, when I went to Russia in the early 1980s, somebody came up to me and said and asked, are there really computers in the Department of Commerce that tell you how to set prices in the United States? And I said, no. <laughs> it's done through the market mechanism. They just didn't understand the market mechanism at all. They had this vision that you would have these big computers someplace, and they would figure out the appropriate prices for all the different commodities, and then you could somehow mathematically optimize that, and if you got the equations right, you would have an efficient economy. And even up to the 1980s, some people thought that. It's amazing. All right. Well, in any case, so there was this fear that the Soviets were going to get ahead of us. Uh, now, you may remember that uh, John F. Kennedy ran in 1960 on the notion of a missile gap. Okay, the Russians are getting ahead of us in nuclear weapons. And, uh, and this was Kennedy's way of presenting himself as strong on national defense. Democrats always have to present themselves as strong on national defense. Uh, and that was his way of doing it. Once he got elected, he said, well, actually, there is no missile gap, uh, which the Republicans have been saying during the campaign. But nevertheless, <laughs> it helped to get him elected. Well, there were people in the CIA and elsewhere in the government that thought that cybernetics was interesting and important. And the, their way of selling it to the government was to say, there's a cybernetics gap. Okay. So the American Society was, for Cybernetics was established in 1964. Uh, and they got money from the National Science Foundation. And Fred Seitz, who was the president of the uh, Academy of Sciences, spoke at the open mean meeting. Uh, and there was definitely some government support for this uh, in the 1960s. Well, the 1960s were a very productive time uh, for cybernetics research. Uh, the Biological Computer Laboratory had been established. The government was interested in uh, supporting it. But it was also a time of the anti-Vietnam War movement, the Civil Rights Movement, campus protests, and so forth. Then came the Mansfield Amendment. Now, the Mansfield Amendment came from Mike Mansfield, who had, was a Democrat, liberal Democrat from Montana, who was uh, Senate Majority Leader. And he was concerned about the protests on campus. And the protests were due to the military research being done on campus. And so in an effort to quiet the campuses, um, he put in the Mansfield Amendment, which said that if the Pentagon supports something, it has to be connected to a military mission. <clears throat> so everybody who was getting money from the Pentagon had to put in a description of how their research was related to a military mission. This had two or, or several interesting consequences. The people who were doing artificial intelligence research primarily at MIT, Stanford, and Carnegie Mellon, got together over coffee and said, OK, <laughs> how was all this related to a military mission? And they came up with the notion of the electronic battlefield, you know, robots on the battlefield. You know, you, your constituents aren't going to get killed. Your sons and husbands aren't going to get killed. We're just going to blow up some robots. And so they wrote that, sent it back to the Pentagon. The Pentagon looked at that and said, ooh, that's interesting. They send it off to Congress, and Congress says, oh, that's interesting. And so Congress passes more money for it, goes to the Defense Department, and they fund artificial intelligence and robotics in a big way. Great. OK. So the Mansfield Amendment hits the Biological Computer Laboratory at the University of Illinois, run by Heinz von Forster, who survived under the Nazis by doing non-militarily related research. And they ask him. How is this related to a military mission? He says, it's not. OK. Sends that back. He says, I'm sorry, Heinz. We can't continue to give you any money. And uh, so that was the end of the Biological Computer Laboratory. It was intended, the Mansfield Amendment, to quiet the campuses. But it had the unanticipated effect of greatly enhancing the research in artificial intelligence and robotics and cutting off research on cybernetics. So Heinz 